Hello again. It's the same place, but a different time of the day, because in the Wind of the Willows, in this first chapter, there goes another part about a river. And I would really love to share it with you slowly and beautifully. We stopped when he um, uncovered there is a river and saw it for the first time, bubbling and everything. By the side of the river he trotted, as one trots when very small by the side of a man who holds one spellbound by exciting stories. It's comparison. And when tired at last, he sat on the bank, while the river still chattered to him, a babbling procession of the best stories in the world. Chattered, it's personalization. And the best stories in the world, metaphor. Sent from the heart of the earth to be told at last to the insatiable sea. That's a metaphor and epithets. It's a, it's a jewelry box of expressive devices. As he sat on the grass and looked across the river, a dark hole in the bank opposite, just above the water's edge, caught his eye, and dreamily he fell to considering what a nice shark dwelling place it would make for an animal with few wounds and fond of a Pidger Riverside residence, above flood level and remote from noise and dust. As he gazed, something bright and small seemed to twinkle down in the heart of it, vanished, then twinkled once more like a tiny star. But it could hardly be a star in such an unlikely situation, and it was too glittering and small for a glow worm. Then, as he looked, it wimpled at him and so declared itself to be an eye, and a small face began gradually to grow up around it, like a frame round a picture. <sighs> I can't stand from uh, catching a, a device or two here. Look, uh, something bright and small seemed to twinkle down in the heart of it. It's a simile. Aha, simile next. Vanished, then twinkled once more like a tiny star, like a tiny star, simile. But it could hardly be a star in such an unlikely situation. It's like a star, it's like an exaggeration. <laughs> and, and it was too glittering and small, okay? <clears throat> then, it winked at him and so declared itself to be an eye. Clear personification. Uh, a small face began gradually to grow up round it. Actually, I... To grow up round it? Maybe you know what's that device. But that's a really strong one. I just love it. But now I... Quit all talking. Besides that, <sighs> and the small face began gradually to grow up round it, like a frame round the picture. A brown little face with whiskers, a grave round face with the same twinkle in the in its eye that had first attracted his notice. Small neat ears and thick silky hair. It was the water rat. When the two en then the two animals stood and regarded each other cautiously. Hullo, mole, said the water rat. Hullo, rat, said the mole. Would you like to come over? inquired the rat presently. Oh, it's, a it's all very well to talk, said the mole, rather pettishly. He being new to a river and the riverside life and its ways. The rat said nothing but stopped and unfastened a rope and hauled on it. 
then lightly stepped into a little boat which the mole had not observed. It was painted blue outside and white within and was just the size for two animals. And the mole's whole heart went out to it at once, even though he did not yet fully understand its uses. The rat sculled smartly across, the made, across and made fast. Then he held up his forepole as the mole stepped gingerly down. Lean on that, he said. Now then, step lively. And the mole, to his surprise and rapture, found himself actually seated in, in the stern of a rare boat. This has been a wonderful day, said he, as the red shoved off and took to the skulls again. Do you know, I've never been in a boat before in my life. What? cried the rat, open mouth. Never been in... You never... Well, I... What have you been doing then? Is it so nice as all that? asked the mole shyly, though he was quite prepared to believe it, as he leaned back in his seat and surveyed the cushions, the oars, the rowlocks, and all the fascinating fittings and felt the boat sway lightly under him. Nice? It's the only thing, said the water rat solemnly, as he leant forward for his stroke. Believe me, my young friend, there is nothing, absolute nothing, half so much worth doing as simply messing about in boats. Simply messing, he went on dreamily. Messing? About in boats messing. Look ahead, Red! cried the mole suddenly. It was too late. The boat stuck the bank full tilt. The dreamer, the joyous oarsman, lay on his back at the bottom of the boat, his heels in the air. About in boats or with boats, the Red went on composedly, picking himself up with a pleasant laugh. In or out of them, it doesn't matter. Nothing seems really to matter. That's the charm of it. Whether you get away or whether you don't, whether you arrive at your destination or whether you reach somewhere else or whether you never get anywhere at all, you're always busy and you never do anything in particular when you've done it. There's always something else to do. And you can do it if you like, but you'd much better not. Look here. You've really nothing else on hand this morning. Supposing we drop down the river together and have a long day of it. All the rest is up to you, if you want. And thus, <laughs> I'm sometimes picking the style from the books. Thus, I leave you alone with this nice book. There. The wind in the willows. I leave you all by yourself, and I will do it by myself. Finish it someday. Goodbye.